When 17-year-old Gabe Mayer went missing in 1993, alarm bells were ringing for the community of Innisfil in Australia. He was a responsible, lovely young boy who would never knowingly worry his parents. A two-week search for Gabe ensued until his lifeless body was eventually found in a shallow grave. This is a case that demonstrates that psychopaths will do anything they can to get what they want. This is the story of Gabe Mayer, a gentle young man who had no enemies and yet still ended up dead. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me as ever. Today's case is astonishing. If ever I was gonna do a case that demonstrates how psychopaths work, today's is going to blow your mind in significance. Also, by the way, if you're new to this channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. It's always crime related. It's usually deep dive and I release it consistently. That's my catchphrase, isn't it guys? crime and consistency. I also want to say a massive thank you to all of you supporting my YouTube membership and on Patreon. Without you, I couldn't do this. So you're flipping great. Thank you very much. If you haven't subscribed yet, why not? Get your notifications on so you never miss an episode. Let's look at Gabe Mayer's life and upbringing. So, so he was one of six children. He was born to Sherry and Doug Mayer. Gabe was born in 1976. And in 1992, the family were actually living in the hometown of Miami. This is where Doug, his dad, had been a boat builder. But they decided they wanted a change of life and also a change of pace. And they actually moved to Innisfail in Australia. They bought a house by the river and it was a really beautiful area. So they genuinely felt at the time it was an incredibly good place to raise a family. It was a place that they believed would have the best interests of their children at heart and provide their children with not just a safe location, but a really natural world around them because nature is literally everywhere in Innisfail. Ironically, one of the things that they tried to escape when they moved was that there was a real growing crime in the area that they'd moved from. So they wanted to avoid their children being at risk. And that is heartbreaking because the story that we're gonna talk about today is how they lose their beloved son, Gabe, to crime. But understandably, from their perspective, moving to this area in Australia, it provided a new backdrop of possibilities for their children. His mother describes Gabe's appearance as beautiful, tall for his age, slender and very sporty. They said if he wasn't fishing, he would be swimming. And Sherry also said that Gabe was just a lovely boy. He was really responsible for his age and his siblings literally idolized him. So they are a genuinely incredibly close family. It is very clear that they are highly connected, that mum and dad have the best interests of their children at heart. They're a big family, a welcoming family, but also an incredibly connected family. So there is an idyllic level to this particular group of individuals who are all related to each other. They genuinely like being around one another. They spend a hell of a lot of time together. And it seems like the siblings had a real duty of care to one another. Now, Damon, Kalenka. Let's look at him for a minute. He was a friend of Gabe Mayer. Now, what's interesting is, even though he was friends with Gabe, he'd also been dating Gabe's 19-year-old sister, Fawn. So they dated only for three weeks, and you know how it is. When you're 19 and you get into a relationship, it can be a bit overwhelming. You can be in a situation where you think it's a good idea, and then like four days later, you're like, what have I done with my life? And the truth is that at 19 years of age, you're probably not on the whole looking for a really connected, committed relationship. You probably just want to have a little bit of fun, test things out. And as far as his sister is concerned, 
Fawn doesn't really think that this relationship is going to go very far. So Fawn and Kalanka basically have this relationship for three weeks in December 1992 to January 1993. What is notable is that Kalanka is actually 26 at the time. And I know that it's completely consenting and legal, but there is quite a big difference between a 19 year old girl and a 26 year old man. Usually a 26 year old will have had significant relationships. They will be working. They will have had experience in the world around them. They're usually a little bit more developed on a sexual intimate relationship level. And therefore that disparity can actually be problematic. Not for everybody. Loads of people have much older spouses. I get it. But I'm just saying a lot of people find that the difference between 19 and 26 can be quite big. It's different as you get older, you kind of get better at communicating between different chronologies and connecting with different chronologies in spite of your younger age if you're with an older person. But certainly when you're young, it can be an issue. Now, both Gabe and Fawn had actually met Kalanka at the gym. Fawn genuinely thought that he was really charming. He was really sweet at first. He was quite charismatic, so to speak. So she's kind of a bit whisked off her feet and they get together because of that. But I will say that Gabe and Fawn's parents, they really weren't keen on the pair being together. They felt that Damon Kalanka was a little bit too intense. And I genuinely can connect with that. If my son brought home a 19 year old when he was 26 i would be a little bit worried about what he saw in that girl at that age and i would be a little concerned about the power disparity as well because i think when you're old you've got a little bit more power about you and younger people will look up to you and it wouldn't necessarily sit well with me also intensity is something we expect in new relationships it really is just think back to when you got with your partner and it was all lust and excitement and fun and you couldn't stop thinking about them and you want to be with them all the time and essentially that is quite normal but at 26 you would imagine that they would have a level of understanding that a 19 year old probably isn't in the same space as they are and so intensity whilst it can be really positive for a short period of time can also be indicative of an individual who's maybe just a little bit controlling now, Gabe and Fawn's parents actually described Kalanka as good looking, very muscular. Also, there were some real positives to him. So he didn't do drugs, he didn't drink alcohol. And it seemed that he was quite into his appearance, basically. He liked looking at himself in the mirror with his muscles. Now, despite Kalanka being kind to Fawn, so genuinely it wasn't as if this guy was being horrible to her, he didn't give off a vibe that made them feel confident that the two were well suited. They weren't in a position to tell her what she should do or who she should or shouldn't date. I mean, she's an adult, maybe just be an adult, but she's still an adult. I mean, remember what you were like when you're 19? Anybody trying to tell me anything at 19, no matter whether they were 16 or 66, would have been met with resistance because I know everything. I know everything. I'm 19. Let me tell you, there's not anything that I don't know apart from pretty much everything that I don't know. But you just have that overconfidence in a lot of cases. My God, I wish I was overconfident now. I wish I was somebody who had the confidence I had when I was 19 in my own points of view. As you get older, you temper them, don't you? And realize that realistically, it's okay for you to have an opinion. It's okay for other people to have an opinion as well, even if it's not the opinion you have. But didn't work that way when I was a kid. So I can understand that even though she's a young adult, her parents are gonna have these misgivings, but not feel that they're in a position to actually direct her to do A, B or C. So they have to leave her to her own devices. And clearly it works because it lasts three weeks and she's on the same page as them. Now, one of the things that the family would not have been aware of at this moment in time is that Kalanka actually had a really violent history. I mean, we're talking a very high level criminal history. So in 1991, he literally attempted to kill a guy called Paul Mellick. Now, the reason that he was motivated to do that was that Paul Mellick became the new boyfriend of his ex-girlfriend. So instantly, we're drawn into the psyche of Kalanka, an individual who feels that when somebody decides that they are gonna date an ex of his, he sees the ex as property, 
and he sees the individual taking that property as disrespectful to him and deserving of consequences. That demonstrates a really malevolent psyche because, of course, first off, a human being doesn't belong to anyone. The relationship's over. They have a right to go and do whatever they want to do. But Kalanka doesn't like that. He wants to keep control. He wants to keep order in his life so far as he believes it should be ordered in a certain way, in this case, with his ex not dating other people. And his response to that is that an innocent man, Paul Mellick, who started to date this girl, now is in the line of fire. So again, the innocent party in this situation, although the girlfriend who is an ex, she's also innocent, but at least there there's a relational experience as to why he feels a level of rage that she's left him potentially. But Paul Mellick is just somebody who started to date her and he has such violent intent that he wants to end Paul Mellick's life. Also, think about the lack of impulse control there. If your ex is dating someone new, if your response, and you believe you have a considered response and an accurate response and an appropriate response, is to kill them, you are not thinking consequentially. And that means you're thinking about short-term gain over long-term consequences. And again, that's a very dangerous mindset to have. And remember, this guy, is somebody who's got the physical domination because of the work that he does at the gym. So it's not as if he hasn't got the capability and capacity to go ahead and harm another human being. What he actually did was he lured Paul into his car and basically said the reason that he wanted to do that is he wanted to have a conversation about his ex-girlfriend. Then he drives them both to a really secluded location and suggests that they get out of the car to talk. Now when Paul tries to get back into the car, Kalanka stabs Paul in the back. Fortunately, what Paul manages to do, and he's got the all wherewithal, so to speak, is to get the knife from Kalanka and he runs away, which is incredibly lucky for him because I don't think he'd have walked away from that at all. Now, at that point, Kalanka's not giving up. He gets back in the car and he actually tries to run Paul over. So we are talking about somebody motivated to kill. This is not somebody who has got into a fight, made a mistake, gone over the top, crime of passion, etc. This is planned, premeditated and carried out. He wants Paul dead. He'll either stab him to death or he'll run him over. Now, fortunately for Paul, to some degree, because obviously there's a real unfortunate reality to what's actually played out, he actually manages to get to someone's front door. There's a local farmer and that local farmer calls the police. So he survives, essentially. And in the call to emergency services, the farmer said that a guy's rocked up on his door who has blood everywhere. He also said that this guy was claiming that someone was trying to kill him. So when this gets to court, it's unreal. Just bear in mind what I've just told you. Kalanka actually tries to murder him with a knife, but then when he doesn't get his way to do that, he tries to run him over. And he's chasing him all the way to the point where Paul is actually lucky enough to get looked after by that farmer. So you would imagine there's going to be an incredibly strong sentencing. You know, this is attempted murder, full stop. But the judge presiding over the case decides to make this incredibly lenient plea bargain. So instead of being charged with attempted murder, Damon Kalanka pleads guilty to unlawful wounding and dangerous driving. Dangerous I mean, it goes without saying it was dangerous dri if you chasing somebody in a car and trying to knock them out. It's pretty dangerous. But there is a massive difference between somebody getting into a car, driving at speed and harming somebody. That is dangerous driving. It's still absolutely going to be prosecuted. There can be some stern sentences, but it's not attempted murder, which clearly and patently this case absolutely 100% is. And the prosecutor, I don't know where they found these, they recommended no time in prison. Sorry, was that the prosecutor? Can you imagine being the person who's in a situation where you want that person tried for attempted murder because they've nearly killed you, you've been stabbed, you've nearly been run over, you're only alive because of the grace of God of the farmer looking after you, and then you're in a situation in court where the judge is like, ah, just drop it to dangerous driving and wounding you know unlawfully and then the prosecutor who's meant to be on your side like yeah we should probably not send him to prison you'd be like i want a knife and a car because i'm going to run these people down and still get no sentence apparently that would be devastating for an actual victim but this is what happens 
And the problem with that is what Clank has learned in this situation is no consequences. You can literally stab somebody in the back and try to run them over and kill them and you'll get a slap on the wrist. In this case, he was sentenced to two years probation and 200 hours of community service. Absolutely pathetic. And the worst bit is they appealed the sentence, right? And this inadequate sentence got upheld after the appeal. Obviously, the judge was like, just going to look at this case and see whether it needs to be made sterner. Oh, it's my friend who was the judge in this case. Oh, it's my friend who was the prosecutor in this case. And I'm going to say, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Do you know what? I'd specifically knock 50 hours off of the community service and just drop the dangerous driving charge. I mean, we've all done it, haven't we? Had a bad day. Tried to mow down a stranger. It's just insane. Also, a police officer who was actually in the case said this. The processes used to reduce the initial charge of attempted murder to unlawful wounding has debauched the system of court justice. Amen to that 100%. Now, it's claimed that the police and the victim weren't actually even consulted when the plea bargain was offered. That in itself is grotesque. Can you imagine not being given the opportunity to hear how this case is going to be pled and what bargains and deals have been made when you're the person who almost lost your life and the fact that Clanker didn't end up in prison for his crime basically meant that he was able to meet and also begin dating form bear that in mind because we look at chain of causation and responsibility this man should have been in prison for attempted murder if he had have been he would have been serving a long sentence then when he got out people would have been like stay the hell away from Kalanka he's somebody who will mow you down and stab you if he's not happy with you right Fawn would never even have looked at him albeit she wouldn't have had the option because he'd have been banged up but because of this he is free to commit further serious crimes without any concern because the system has played into his hands and that's a dangerous game for a psychopathic mindset and believe me Kalanka is one of the most psychopathic types of human being we could ever envisage. And you will understand this when we get towards the end of this story, because it's all going to become clear as to why I'm so fixated on the term psychopath in this case. And also in the way that these individuals will do and act and be certain things to certain people to achieve whatever it is they wish to gain. We get to December 1992. At this point, Fawn actually says to Clanker, because bear in mind, this is when they first start dating, that she's going to go to the USA to pursue her studies. So she's going to go to university there, obviously, even though it's incredible where they've been growing up and living. The USA has got far more opportunities university wise where it's concerned. So educationally, she's a bright button. She wants to go places that mean that she's going to have the best opportunities future wise in her career. Now, Kalanka is really, really upset by this news, and that's okay, of course. If you care for somebody, even if you've just been seeing them a few weeks, and then they tell you, I'm going to be leaving you, it's going to break your heart a little bit. But most of us, we lick our wounds, we keep in touch, we move forward, and we let people go, because you have to. Otherwise, your life will be a complete tragedy. A lot of people come into your life, they will leave you, and that's all right. And particularly when there is a reasoning behind it, such as university, we would expect a man of 26 to have the maturity emotionally to connect the dots and realise that that's best for her. But not Kalanka. He's very, very upset about this. And Gabe's parents actually said that they notably saw that. He was somebody who made it very clear that when Fawn left, he was totally devastated. And Gabe's family was so lovely that because they kind of wanted to, I suppose, reach out and meet him in that emotional void, they felt because he was an alone person, he didn't have family around him to hang out with, that they could invite him for Christmas so they could spend Christmas with him to lessen the blow. And that's what he did. Now, at this point, when Fawn has gone to the States, Damon Clanka was writing to her sometimes twice a day. He's absolutely desperate for her to come home. So she is getting bombarded 
with these letters. Now, on one level, some people will look in and say, well, you know, on a psychological level, people have got a lot to say. They miss that person. They're intoxicated by that person. They want to maintain a relationship with them and they write to them consistently and persistently. And often the person receiving that will find that incredibly romantic, alluring and connecting relationship wise. But they've only been seeing each other a few weeks and Fawn is at university trying to have fun. Can we just put it out there? She has a lot to do that doesn't involve him, but he does not let up. Even though she's not expressed that she wants this to continue, he is going to be very persistent. And he had this idea that even though she had broken the relationship off, they could carry on, even though she'd moved away to another country. And she just got really exhausted with this. So on January the 5th, 1993, she actually ended up phoning him and said, look, can you please leave me alone? And Fawn told Kalanka that in no uncertain terms, the relationship was over. She was very clear about it. There was no, the door is left open, let's see how it goes. Which isn't the way I'd have handled it, actually. I'd have been one of those people who gradient-wise just got less and less in contact to a point where I'd petered the relationship out. Maybe ending it with that classic, it's not you, it's me. I'm the problem, that's why I'm ending it. Which really means it's definitely you, it's you. It's not me, it's you. That's why I'm ending the relationship with you. Because if it was me, then I wouldn't be ending the relationship with you because it would be me, but it is you. You know the old way that it works to just kind of desensitize yourself to the horrible process of ending the relationship. But she's very clear about it. Like I said, she lets him know. And he was apparently filled with absolute rage upon hearing this. He was obsessed, fixated, really, really fixated, in fact, with Fawn. And his whole life's work in that moment was to get her back. And Fawn said to Damon Kalanka, listen, the only reason I would ever come back to Australia during my period of being in the States is if something happened to my family. What an innocent sentence to speak. It's so intriguing to me that you can say something that's obviously a thing of sense. So if you are in a situation where a family member gets sick or somebody dies or somebody's harmed, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get on a plane if you're in another country and come home because you love them and you want to show them support. And so when she's talking to Kalanka and saying this is what would make me return, as far as she's concerned, she's being very clear that there is nothing on God's earth that will bring her home to him unless something really bad happens, meaning please stop contacting me, stop believing there's going to be anything within our relationship that connects us again, because the only reason I'd come home is if something happened to somebody else, nothing to do with you at all. So you're the irrelevant factor here. I don't want to see you. I don't want to come home to see you. The only reason you would see me again is if something happened to my family. But Damon Kalanka hears that differently. Like I said, a psychopath wants what they want. And how they achieve it is irrelevant, as long as they achieve it. And whoever that costs, and however it costs them, it doesn't matter. What matters is they've set their mind on a journey, on a path, and they'll exploit whoever they need to, to achieve that. And Damon Kalanka, from that moment, starts calculating one of the most twisted plans ever to bring her home. We get to January the 12th, 1993. Gabe's father innocently drops him off at a gym in Innisfail. Just an ordinary day, an ordinary reality, his son going to the gym to keep fit. Little did Doug know that tragedy was about to unfold for his family. When Gabe doesn't return home for tea, his parents start panicking immediately. Immediately. Because this young man doesn't do that. His mother said straight away, I knew in my heart, in my gut, something terrible had happened. They trust Gabe. They know that there is no way he would not be home at the time he said he was going to be home without letting them know. In fact, he'd never miss a dinner. He'd always call to let them know he'd be late. And at this point, both his parents are really scared. And Doug calls the hospital just in case. But at that point, Gabe hadn't been admitted there. 
They have no idea where he has disappeared to. And we are talking about him disappearing into thin air. The next morning, he still hadn't returned home and you just instantly have that feeling of empathy with the family, don't you? They know there is no way Gabe would not be coming home. There is no way that he is okay. If he's not home, he wouldn't run away. He's happy. He's got a life that he loves. If he isn't returning home, it's because he can't. His parents then drive to Kalanka's house because, of course, they're meant to be friends. And he'd actually met Gabe at the gym the day before. Now, Damon Kalanka said that Gabe had come to his flat after the gym. So they now know that after the gym, he'd apparently been okay. But then he'd left when it was almost dark because he said he wanted to go swimming in the Johnston River. I had another day I was going with his sister, Helen, I met her, and she went to America. And um, family got really close to me, and her brother came to the gym. And I've been at the gym all the time, and I've been just like, just a close friend from at the gym. Now, his family and his friends thought that was really strange. They said that was unusual. He wouldn't usually swim in the river. First of all, just going to throw it out there. Gabe is a very intelligent, very athletic, very sensible to the point where he's always home for dinner and responsible young man. I have lived in Australia. It's beautiful. One of my favourite places in the world. But I also know I ain't going swimming in no river, particularly in areas like Innisfail. Why? Because it's infested with crocodiles. You know, the kind of crocodiles that will death roll you and eat you. Which is not something that I believe Gabe would feel was a good idea. So he knows not to swim there. And the fact that Kalanka's actually saying that is very questionable. And as far as I'm concerned, very suspicious. Also, bear in mind... This is a young man who literally had grown up around boats, around water. His dad was a boat maker. So if it wasn't the right weather, if it wasn't the right light, certainly if it was infested with a predatory animal, he ain't going in. So his family end up checking the river, of course they do, but they can't find anything. And again, now they're in a situation where somebody has suggested that he was saying he was going somewhere it was apparently to a crocodile infested river and he's just disappeared. But for the police, for example, investigating this, well, it could be that Gabe has suddenly gone somewhere that seems completely left field for his actions prior to this, but it would distort the investigation a little bit. The family go to the police, of course they do, and they said that the name Kalanka worried them immediately. This is the young man who they have already been aware of because of his previous crime that he shouldn't even be walking the streets because of. So that attack on Paul Mellick that I was telling you about earlier, that had only just occurred 14 months earlier. So they're instantly aware that Damon Kalanka has got form. He's an individual who's dangerous. He's an individual who's violent. He's an individual that he has an ax to grind. He's literally going to use an ax, simple as. So... Initially, they start investigating by inquiring at the gym. And there were witnesses there saying, yep, yeah, Gabe had been there and that he'd left around 4.30pm that day. And then when the police go and interview Damon Kalanka, he said that he had spent time working out with Gabe at the gym, that Damon Kalanka had given Gabe a protein shake and then Gabe had left to go swimming and he'd left to go swimming around 5.30pm. Now, the police obviously have to consider that Gabe did this and got taken by a crocodile at this stage. So they end up searching the Johnston River, but there's nobody that turns up. So this concerns them, of course. They're in a scenario where they're being told that a body should be there, but they're not finding one. And it's also by somebody who should have been done for attempted murder. And I guess the hackles would be going up on the necks of all of those officers who were looking into this case. But then they get this phone call. And the phone call comes in from, I suppose, a concerned member of the public to some degree. The reason I say to some degree will become clear shortly. They said that they'd basically seen some stuff down by the pontoon on January the 12th. They'd seen shoes, a bag, and a towel. But for some reason, once they'd seen shoes, a bag, and a towel, their response to this was not to go, oh, 
somebody's shoes, bag and towel. Is there anybody around? Maybe somebody's in distress because obviously there are items here that suggest an individual could be maybe swimming, for example. So we should either look and see whether anybody is in distress or see whether there's a body floating anywhere or call emergency services just to check. We could do all of those things, but instead we're going to throw them all in the river. They literally did that. They just took shoes, a bag and a towel that weren't theirs and just threw them in the river. People are just so weird, aren't they? Like, what a weird thing to do. But with respect, at least they have some guilt and conscience about it and they realise that it could actually be Gabe's. So they decide to call that information in. Now, police divers then search the river after that information comes to light and they actually had to use explosives because obviously it was infested with crocodiles. Now, when they do that, they actually almost immediately find a watch and Gabe's parents confirm it was his. Also, they find a shoe and they find a bag. All of that had been washed up. So at this point, it doesn't, even though it feels like there's something gruesome occurred to Gabe, doesn't actually shed a light on whether he's dead or alive because arguably those things were thrown into the river. They haven't found a body. They found a watch, but it could be that he didn't end up in the river at all and that maybe he's just disappeared. Although for me, if you're finding a watch that belongs to somebody, if you're finding items of clothing that were thrown into the river and they haven't turned up, albeit that somebody else threw them in, I'm still, because of the watch, going to be thinking, oh my God, my son isn't coming home. Now, Detective Inspector Stan Kruger, he said, the watch wasn't a diver's watch and isn't the type that would accidentally fall off. So he believed it would actually have had to be removed by someone. And it had actually been found within throwing distance from the side of the lake. So again, it's quite incriminating because if you think about somebody going swimming and getting attacked by a crocodile, by the time the watch comes off the wrist, you would imagine there'll be some distance from where the attack's taken place. But if you are trying to create a scene that makes it seem that somebody has been taken by a crocodile, if you throw a watch, and you kind of see how far that distance would be, it connects when you're an investigator to think this is somebody trying to create a false narrative. And Detective Kruger, I think, is really on the ball thinking that and coming out with that suggestion. Now, Damon Kalanka's alibi, because of course he has one, he said the night that Gabe went missing, he'd actually hired a vehicle to drive to Tully because allegedly his sister needed a carpet, which he had in the back of a truck. But he said that, the problem was it started to rain really, really heavily, so he had to turn back and he had to go home because he didn't want this carpet to get wet. Now, the police have to check the alibi, so they have a look at the carpet and they notice that it's really old and really stained. Now. I am not a snob. I grew up in a very working class environment. We had threadbare carpets on the floor for a very long time when I was a young person. At the end of the day, that's how we rocked and rolled in the 80s. But my parents, who were savvy and were quite thrifty, I am a little bit thrifty myself. If there's a bargain to be had, I will have them. I am the person who spends at least half an hour searching for vouchers for the sites that I use to buy anything from. And if I don't get at least 10% off, I will wait. I will wait sometimes months for that. To, even if that 10% is only nine quid, I'm going to wait. So I've been brought up in that area and era. And I can remember when my mum and dad got rid of their carpet. My dad brought their carpet to my house and I had their shall we say slightly worn carpet, fitted in different pieces, because obviously my house had a different shape to their house, in my own lounge. Because, you know, why not? But let me tell you, if that carpet had been stained and old and threadbare, I'd have been like, not today, mum. Even for me, that's a stage too far. So they know, why would you be taking this carpet to your sisters? But also, if it's so done in, why would it matter that it was getting rained on? Who knows? that could actually be positive because the rainwater may clean some of the stains out of it, particularly acid rain these days. Quite acidic, isn't it? Probably just do something good for that actual situation. 
So it's an unlikely gift is what I'm saying. But also one of Kalanka's neighbours, he said that he'd actually seen him putting the carpet into the back of the truck that night because he'd given that neighbour a lift to the pub. And with the carpet in the back of the truck, one of the things that the actual investigators found was that the mileage on the rented truck didn't match with the distance of the place that he claimed to have travelled. So Damon Kalanka had actually driven 119 kilometres and the police, who were brilliant in this case, they actually recreated the route that Damon Kalanka told them that he'd driven and they found that the route that he'd driven would have only taken 61 kilometres journey-wise. So he must have driven somewhere else. So on one hand, they have, to some degree, his alibi being justified by his neighbour, who's seen him with the carpet and taken him. But then the story basically goes cold to some degree, or hot when it comes down to who's being responsible for these scenarios playing out, because it doesn't fit what he's suggesting distance-wise. So they believe that Damon Clank is involved in the disappearance of Gabe. But sadly, when they test the carpet and also the forensics are done on the truck itself, they all come back negative. So there's no connection with Gabe. It's a dead end. So it means that even though they genuinely believe that he was involved in Gabe's disappearance, they couldn't actually validate that. There was nothing that could say that Gabe had been in the vehicle. Also, when they do a search on Kalanka's flat, it turns up nothing. So two weeks after Gabe's just disappeared into thin air and his family are just totally distraught, there's no promising leads whatsoever, which is incredibly frustrating. You know, the police aren't stupid. They know that this particular individual is a violent perpetrator. They know that Gabe and he have a relationship of some sorts. They don't know why Gabe would be a victim of this man. Nonetheless, they're in a scenario where they genuinely feel that it's likely Gabe's come to some harm and they can't piece the jigsaw together. Meaning that yet again, at this moment in time, Kalanka is walking the streets free. He shouldn't be in the first place, as we now know, because he should have absolutely been done for Paul's horrible assault and violent murder almost. And he got away with that. And now it seems like he's getting away with Gabe's disappearance. And it's not like the police are trying to pin this on him. It's that they know that there are too many coincidences that mean that he is the most likely candidate for being their main suspect. Now, the police get another call. This time, it's from someone called James Potter. Now, James Potter is only 15 years of age. He claims that he's a friend of Damon Kalanka. And he said that he knew that the police were actually having conversations with Kalanka and Whilst he didn't know whether the information that he was gonna tell the police was actually useful, it was playing on his mind. And bear in mind, this young man's 15. And don't get me wrong, I genuinely believe that most humans are good humans, right? We all have shades, we all have bad days. You should see me on a Monday morning. I have bad days. No coffee's helpful. But the reality is that if there is something that is playing on your mind and you can't let that go because you've seen, you've felt, you've heard something and it just doesn't fit or it concerns you and then you keep ruminating on that, it's genuinely because your psyche and consciousness is telling you it's knocking on the door and saying, this isn't right, act on this. But I still think it's pretty incredible that this 15 year old gets in contact with the police to have this conversation. And even though he's saying, I don't know whether it's useful, it's always better to pass that information on because you just have no idea. That tiny piece of the jigsaw can absolutely be the final piece that's required. And if you don't do anything with that information, that jigsaw will never be completed. And that can mean that cases go cold and it can mean that people who are guilty as hell get to walk around innocently as far as the general public is concerned for the rest of their lives. So one of the things that Damon Kalanka had done is he'd taken this 15 year old on January the 10th, which is just a few days earlier, and he'd taken him to Polly Creek. Now, whilst Kalanka was there, he made a trail and he actually marked a spot in the woods. Now, James had found this really weird. And Damon Kalanka had actually said to James, could I borrow a shovel? Now again, why are you going down this trail asking to borrow a shovel, what the hell are you doing with that shovel? Because clearly it's about either digging something up or burying something. 
So the police actually investigate this lead and they do find the trail. And this trail leads down to this really deep hole in the ground. And basically that deep hole looks like a grave. Actually looks like a grave the size that you would need for a male human body. Now it's empty, but nonetheless, the police consider this very suspicious. Why would anybody be taking a shovel down a trail to dig a man-sized hole? It makes no sense whatsoever. So the police then interview Damon Kalanka about this and he instantly, because he's a little bit savvy now with the legal system, he asks for an adjournment and he asks for a solicitor. Now, when the interview ends up continuing, he basically says, okay, the reason that I didn't want to talk to you about this is because I was doing something naughty. Basically, I was going to grow marijuana. So I dug this hole. It was six feet long. It was two feet deep to do this. Really? Six feet long, two feet deep. That's a little bit, I don't know, we'll stir it out there, like the size of a grave for an adult human male. Just throwing it out there. What do you think, Mrs. Solicitor, that is dragged in? Anyway, this is really suspicious. And also, that hole that big wasn't actually needed to grow this. You wouldn't need a hole that huge to grow marijuana. It's as simple as that. And also, Clank has never even been involved with drugs. He's not been involved with anything like that. That's the whole premise of his kind of clean eating, clean living system. Also, it was a really bad place to actually grow weed because there were loads of trees. And obviously, the thing about trees is they're very beautiful. They're required for our oxygen. But they obviously shade certain areas. So in the back garden of mine, I've got protected trees. I love them. My neighbours don't love them. They think it blocks light. But nonetheless, I feel like I have been trusted with these trees. They're on protected levels, which means that no one can cut them down. And I feel that they are really important to me. However, totally screws up my garden beneath it. My garden is not something that thrives because it isn't getting the light. So if you're going to grow weed, you need the sun and those trees are blocking the sun. So it's too big, it's not sunny, it's in a completely inappropriate place, and it's not close to where Kalanka lives. So therefore, these are all indicators that this is just bullshit. Now, Damon Kalankin then gets directly asked what he thought of the notion that he had killed Gabriel to get born to return to Australia, because that is what the investigators believe. You know what I said earlier on about the lens the psychopath will go to to get what they want just let that sink in for a minute that maybe gabriel is dead murdered because fawn had suggested that the only reason that she would return to australia is if something terrible had happened to her family but apparently when he's actually asked about this, he said he didn't understand that train of thought because he absolutely loves Gabe's family. He said, I've got no intention of hurting anybody and I would never do something like that. I just think that in that moment, the detective may have wanted to rewind a little bit and been like, can you just explain that again? You're saying that you would never do anything like this. Absolutely right, mate. Not a chance. Didn't you just get quite a lot of community service because you basically tried to mow an innocent guy down after stabbing him in the back and he was only saved by a farmer? Mate, totally different set of circumstances. Don't know what you're on about. I'm pretty sure you are capable of murder and it's just that the prosecution and the judge lost their marbles and allowed you a lesser charge and a plea deal. All I'm saying, mate, is there's no way I have it within myself to do anything so horrible. You're a massive liar. And even if I have to walk to the ends of the earth, face Beelzebub himself and walk through an eternity of fire, I will have you charged with this murder. That's how it would go in my little vision. Anyway, no, apparently wouldn't hurt anybody. Would never do anything like that. I apologize in advance for my attempt at an Australian accent there. I don't know why I did that, but you know me carry on regardless. Anyway, the police end up speaking to Fawn and they want her on side for obvious reasons because they know that he's got this fixation and obsession about her and they hope that by speaking to her and actually getting her to ask questions to Damon Kalanka, 
he may well start to implicate himself in the disappearance about Gabe. So she goes ahead and she's also interested to know if Kalanka is going to let any information slip that's going to be helpful to finding him. That's the most important thing that she can do. She absolutely dotes on his brother. She's willing to do that immediately. And they actually record the call. And in that call, she basically creates this ruse and she says, the only reason I would come back is if I absolutely knew that Gabe hadn't run away. Now, unfortunately, he didn't go ahead and give her any useful information. It could be that he was suspicious. Bear in mind, she'd asked him to go away. She said she didn't want a relationship with him. She basically kind of indicated he was harassing her a little bit. And she'd also indicated that there was no way that she was coming back to him because she didn't want that relationship with him. So it could be that he thinks, why would she be asking me this information? Why would she be investing in this information in me? I think that this is suspicious. Or it could be that he wants to find out information off her as to how to get her home without actually committing to implicating himself in any other way. We get to January the 26th. Now, at this point, a member of the public, Margaret Carmichael, calls the police. And this call changes the face of the investigation, full stop. So Margaret had actually taken a walk the night before she called the police. And as she was walking, she was basically hit by this really pungent smell. It was the smell of something really, really bad. And she hoped that it was a dead pig. But the fact that she's ringing the police and the fact that, notably, it's a smell that really resounds with her. It doesn't sound like this is going to be a dead pig. And the reason I say this is because we are physiologically hardwired to know the smell of human decay. It's a way of warning us. It's primordial. It's survival mechanism instinct orientated. And that means that if we smell it, it hits us in a way that even the smell of rotting meat of other animals or mammals would actually hit us with because it's basically something that we are meant to stay away from. If you smell a dead body, clearly the indicator is you are at potential risk. So it's meant to make you recoil. So she obviously feels very disconcerted by this. She's hoping it might be a dead animal, but you can tell that she actually believes that there is something bigger and more horrible out there. So she feels that possibly this could be a dead body. Now also there was a possible grave in that area and ironically where the smell of this hopeful dead pig was, it's right by where Damon's parents live because they live right by Margaret. And for the investigators, this sounds like a very promising but very upsetting lead. She also tells the police that she saw Damon Kalanka riding a bike through the area the same morning. So investigators rushed the area, of course they do, and sadly the investigators find a shallow grave and in that shallow grave they find a body of a young man wrapped in a blanket. He's got rope around the wrists and ankles. The detective, Sergeant Mick Jacobs, had to go and let the family know. They had to let them know that they believed at that point, it wasn't confirmed, but that they believed that they had unfortunately found the body of Gabe. He actually said that breaking the news to that family was literally one of the most difficult tasks of his life. The area that we were talking about in Australia where they live, it is not known for crime. That's why the family had left America. They wanted to go somewhere for a quiet, safe life. And here they are dealing with the potential murder of their son. Gabe's body was found just two weeks after he'd gone missing and this wasn't a big police department. This was about really old-fashioned committed investigation and these police officers, these detectives, they cared deeply. They took it personally. This wasn't just another homicide. This was a homicide that occurred in their local area and affected people that they cared for. So the task force themselves, it felt like they were losing one of their own because it was so close to their community. You know, they knew the parents, they knew the people, and profoundly, they didn't bring Gabe home alive. And it was devastating for all of them. Now, the police, at this point, they actually appeal on the national news with the images of the blanket that was found in the grave. And it's at this point that Damon Kalanka's ex-wife actually calls to say, I recognise that blanket. And she believed that they'd had that blanket when they were together and then he'd kept it when they'd separated. Also, Kalanka's flatmates called and they said, listen, 
We used to have some really similar rope that's clearly been used to tie Gabe's limbs in our flat, but it's just gone. And they looked for it and they couldn't find it. So this is all further evidence against Damon Kalanka. And it's also testament to a small community and how that small community comes together in these moments. You know, they have a relationship with Kalanka and yet they are willing to usurp that relationship because they want justice done. And I also think that that's demonstrating that there is an oddness about Kalanka as a human being. Because if you had flatmates and you got on really well with them and you seem to be a very typical, well-adjusted human being, even if rope had disappeared from your flat and been found on a body locally to you, it's highly unlikely that if you thought the person you were living with was normal, that you'd immediately go, they've probably murdered them. I mean, genuinely, if rope went from my house and then a body was turned up and it was the same kind of rope, I'd see that as coincidence. I wouldn't see that as a potential lead to a suspect. And so these individuals clearly have reservations and concerns about Damon Kalanka's behaviour and the kind of human being that he is. Now, the blanket gets sent off for forensic analysis. And when they do that, fibres are found that match the carpet, that carpet that apparently his sister wanted. Apparently, I'd like, as your sister, to have a battered old carpet, please. One thing that I'm going to say is don't bring it wet. I don't want it being brought in the rain. Honestly, man, could you not? But anyway, it matches the carpet that Damon's transported on the back of the rented truck. So now we're getting him bang to rights. Police also found a small piece of plastic which was stuck to Gabe's face. And that was actually part of a plastic bag which they believe had been tied over Gabe's head. Now, when they looked at the cause of death, understandably, it's quite complicated. Bear in mind, we're in a situation where there's been a huge amount of decomposition over those weeks. So it's not initially obvious how he died. When they look at his body, it doesn't seem that there are any very obvious blows to it. It doesn't seem like he's got some kind of injury from a knife or a gun or blunt force trauma. But when they test his body toxicology wise, wow. It's a different story. So it turns out that he had been given a really lethal combination of drugs. Now, these combination of drugs are usually found in cold and flu tablets, but the amount that Gabe had been given, the amount he had in his system, it would have just literally knocked him unconscious and eventually would have actually killed him. But the suspicion is that even though he'd been very heavily drugged and he would have died unless he's had intervention with these drugs themselves, he likely also got suffocated. So that's why the plastic bag remnant was on his face because it strongly suggested that as he was unconscious, Kalanka actually suffocated him to get the job done. Also, it's believed that that poisonous concoction that he was given was in that protein shake that he talked about. So he told the investigators that that's what he and Gabe had done. They'd gone and had a protein shake together on the day that Gabe went missing. So the belief is that Damon Kalanka poisoned him, suffocated him, and then wrapped Gabe in that carpet, put him in the back of the rented truck to transport his body. Also, when they speak to pharmacists in the local area, there's a local one who had the receipt from Damon buying two packs of those cold and flu tablets. They'd been bought on the 6th of January. That was the day after Fawn had ended their relationship. The day after. So when she had said that she didn't want to be with him anymore and the only reason that she'd come home was if something happened to her family, it took about 24 hours for him to go and buy the necessary items that would mean he could ideally get her home. Even if getting her home involved the murder of her brother. When you think about psychopathy, you think about an individual who wants to exploit for their own gain. There is nothing more great than the example I've just given. A man who thought that Gabe was so disposable, so dispensable, that he could literally kill him just in the hope that Fawn would come home because she was concerned. Not even with the promise of their relationship actually working, just to get her back. That is 
beyond twisted, but also demonstrates what we see in serious psychopaths. They will do anything. They will harm anyone. They will remove every obstacle in their path, even if those obstacles are people of great meaning who've done absolutely nothing wrong as long as it serves their purpose. And also, the fact there had been a time period in between him getting those and killing Gabe means that they were extremely premeditated actions. And bear in mind, he'd only just spent Christmas with Fawn and Game's family. That is mind-blowing. This was a planned, calculated, cold execution. And finally, there was enough evidence to arrest Damon Kalanka. When they did arrest him, he showed absolutely no emotion whatsoever. In fact, the arresting officer commented that he was indeed a sociopath. Now, one of the things that was absolutely necessary in this case is that they had to prove that Kalanka had actually killed Gabe with intent. So it wasn't a crime of passion in the heat of the moment, because obviously a premeditated murder is the most serious murder. It doesn't mean that somebody's not going to get a strong sentence if they actually kill somebody in the heat of the moment. But even though a normal, well-adjusted, typical human can never understand doing that to anybody, certainly there is a spectrum where these kind of killings occur. And if somebody is full of rage, incandescent in that moment, in that situation with those feelings, and then acts in a way that is not necessarily in keeping with who they ordinarily are, you can kind of say, okay, this ultimately is a terrible thing. They need to go to prison for a very long time. But we can also see how this situation unfolded and led to this person being killed. When it's premeditated, when there's no heat, when it's cold, manipulative, calculating, that is the most dangerous type of human that exists in our world because they can do it again and again and again. And if it works for them, why wouldn't they? Now, surprisingly, Damon Clanker's sister, Deborah, she said to him, you need to tell the family the truth. She said, for once in your life, I want you to be a man and tell us the truth. She actually said that he had been notably a compulsive liar since day one. And of course, what we see with psychopaths is they tend to be compulsive liars. And apparently, in spite of the fact that he has lied his way throughout his life and done these heinous things, for whatever reason, her actually having that conversation to and with him did something. And apparently he just trembled and said, I did it. And she asked, why? And he replied that Gabe had been coming on to him in the gym. He'd become angry at this. He'd lost control and he'd strangled him. I would like this person to be immediately vaporized. It is so disrespectful to bring Gabe into this scenario as a predator. That's what he's saying. He's saying that Gabe was sexually predatory around him in spite of the fact that Gabe knew he'd been out with his sister and therefore he was straight and this shook him to the core and basically made him react and act out in this case losing control and strangling him. I mean the stages and steps to go from oh somebody's making a pass at me to I'm gonna kill you now is so insane that even using this as a potential excuse just makes him look more guilty than ever. But again, what do we know about Kalanka? Very easily, we know that he doesn't believe consequences apply to him. He's got away with this before, so we'll just create this cover story. It's all Gabe's fault. Bob's your uncle. He'll be free soon, won't he? Doing a bit more community service with the prosecution going, don't send him to prison. He's perfectly safe. It's only the second time, and this time he successfully murdered somebody, but just let him be free. So she's obviously very pro-social. She wants the family to understand that they deserve that closure and also she wants justice for Gabe and his family. But he is creating this disrespectful backstory. It's tactical. He thinks he'll receive a shorter sentence for manslaughter if that's the case because obviously he can apply that logic and say, well, I was acting in the heat of the moment. I felt threatened by this sexual predator and the consequence is I didn't know what to do so I strangled and killed him. And that can reduce the sentence that you're going to serve. But of course, the thing that Damon Clanker isn't thinking through is the police already know that he'd preemptively dug 
a grave. So six foot by two foot, the size of a human male. The consequence is this man premeditated this young man's murder and then went through with it, knowing exactly what he was going to do with the body. There is absolutely no way that story is going to stack up, not for the investigators and certainly not where the prosecution is concerned. When it went to trial, Damon Kalanka was sentenced to life in prison. And the non-parole period was surprisingly and sadly only for 13 years. That means that after 13 years in prison, he's able to apply for parole every single year after this period of time. Now, that to me is disgraceful. When you have premeditated a murder, when you're an individual so warped in your psyche that you believe because you want to see somebody again, it's okay to kill their brother just to create that opportunity, you are always going to be a risk and a threat to the public. You are always going to be an individual who is a danger to society. You should not be walking the streets by any stretch of the imagination. And also, for Doug and Sherry Mayer, every single year when it comes down to the parole, they have to fight against it. They have to make it clear about the impact on them as victims, of them as a family, who've had their family dismantled because this individual was so selfish, egotistical and self-indulgent about their own needs that murdering an innocent young man with his life to live, who was a wonderful human being, was something that he believed was acceptable as long as he achieved his goal of getting form back. It is horrifying that 13 years is seen as an appropriate minimum sentence to serve before parole occurs. Also, I'm going to go back to what I said at the very beginning, which blows my mind. The fact about this case is he should never have had the chance to murder Gabe. If Damon Kalanka had been adequately tried and sentenced, he would have been punished in a way that meant he couldn't kill. When he tried to murder Paul Mellick, and he definitely tried to murder him, he should have gone to prison. He should have been unable to go on to murder Gabe. Form would never have been interested in him. The family would have made sure that he was kept at arm's length from Gabe because he would have been bad news. Doug Mayer said it would have been a completely different story for us if the right sentence for Mellick had been served. Now, both the murder of Gabe and the attempted murder of Paul, when you look at them, Wow, really similar motive. So in both of the cases, when you think about it, neither of the victims had done anything wrong whatsoever. They were just innocent bystanders in the warped world of Kalanka. But what they had done was they'd been close to ex-girlfriends who had chosen to end things with Damon Kalanka. So this was basically an attempt for Damon to potentially rekindle a lost love in both circumstances. That was the driving force. That he literally balances killing someone with getting an ex back. It is so warped, so deviant, so despicable, so devastating for all those who were affected. And yet for him, it's a simple trajectory. I either get what I want, or I'm willing to do anything to at least try to return what that thing is that I believe I've lost. That is monumentally psychopathic beyond belief. Now in 1995, Doug and Sherry actually set up the Queensland Homicide Victim Support Group, which is just demonstrative of the pro-social nature of this family and these people. And the whole premise of this is it supports families who've been affected by homicide. They've got a team of counsellors, they've got a team of peer supporters, they've got volunteers, aid in advocacy and also education. So they are individuals who have taken all of that pain, all of that grief, all of that loss, all of, I suppose, their profound rage at times and they have just ploughed it in to helping others. No wonder that young man was such an incredible human being with parents and mentors like he had. He was lucky. I mean, he wasn't lucky enough to survive the life in a length that he deserved, but he was lucky to have been loved and brought up by those incredible human beings who have taken all of that pain and put it into something of legacy for him. 
because in every moment, every action, in every reaching of a family who've struggled, he is behind that messaging. And that means that he lives on and he will always be young, yes, always be missed, yes, but he'll never ever be forgotten. And that's something that Kalanka will certainly be, mostly by design, because who wants to remember an absolute horrible human like him, but also because he did nothing for this world at all. Now for Gabe's family, the experience of knowing that Damon was going to be eligible for release in 2006, at least first to be held by the parole board to understand whether that individual was going to be safe to get out. You have to put yourself in the position of it being totally unimaginable for the family to see that man walking around free when Gabe was murdered by him, knowing that he still has a life, he has freedom, he has an opportunity to be free, have a family, live his life again fully, when their son had it stolen from him in the most macabre, malevolent, and despicable of ways. And so every single year, understandably, the family, when the parole hearing came up, went ahead and made it clear the impact and devastation that it had caused when they had lost Gabe. But in spite of this, in 2020, he was quietly released. It's inconceivable. Damon Kalanka was released into the public domain in 2020. It's shocking considering the severity of his crime. And also bear in mind when he actually killed Gabe, he was doing community service. So he was basically on parole, so to speak, then because he was in a scenario where he was being watched by probation. He was doing community service because of this awful crime against Paul. And yet it didn't deter him from murdering Gabe. Doug Mayer actually said, about the parole experience, each time we plead with the parole board and try to point out what we know, which is that he will kill again on release. It's just a matter of time. Fawn, she understandably said that she would fear for her and her family's safety if he was ever released. Kalanka did have five of his applications for parole rejected and an excerpt from a report in which Dr. Pork, a psychologist made in 2015, said this. It should be noted that Mr. Kalanka's extreme violent disposition appears to only have surfaced in response to being rejected by girlfriends. Hence, Mr. Kalanka's relapse prevention strategies remain untested. In the past, he was extremely revengeful and planful and he did not hesitate to use violence if he felt his relationships were threatened. There is no doubt that he may have matured over the last 22 years and he appears confident that he can deal with difficult relationship issues. He certainly does have more skills to handle issues of rejection now than when he did 22 years ago at the age of 25, but whether he will use these skills in the future remains to be seen. Now in 2019, Damon asked for a review of the rejection of his parole and the outcome of this was, as I said, that he was unfortunately released from prison in February 2020. And it's shocking when you consider that, as is noted by the psychologist, the very strategies that we know may fail could mean that somebody else dies. He's never been able to test the fact that he's matured when it comes down to relationships and women. So if somebody spurns his advances, if somebody rejects him in a relationship, what could play out next? When he was released fully from prison, he'd already been working in a supervised way in a place called Tuwamba. So this was part of his supervised release. He also had a job lined up. He had a place to live lined up on release. And a psychologist believed that he had truly been rehabilitated. Apparently he'd been a model inmate. But as I say, Dr. Polk's observation for 2015 still stands. His strategies for prevention are untested outside of prison. When the circumstances which caused his violence come and be present again, the truth is that he may not be able to resist what we've seen in the past. He might have been a model prisoner inside, but this doesn't translate to behavior in the real world. 
everything is ordered, everything is organized, you don't have a lot of opportunities in prison, you're certainly not having relationships in prison. So the reality is that you can take a very violent offender who knows how to behave themselves for the duration of their sentence. But in the real world, without those boundaries, in the real world, without the inflexibility that exists within the prison system, in the real world where he can experience jealousy and rejection and rage in relationships, he could snap again. His good behavior in prison was also very lightly motivated by his desire to be released. And that's a level of manipulation that's demonstrated in his character as well. And my God, one thing we can definitely say about this psychopathic killer is manipulation runs through every single cell in his body. My heart goes out to Gabe's family, it really does. If I was the mother in this situation, I would feel betrayed by a system that had failed me initially and feels like it failed me again. I would really like to have your comments. As I said at the very beginning of this, if you ever wanna see a psychopath in motion, then Damon Kalanka exemplifies it. Killing an innocent party just so he can get to see a girl that he liked again. Isn't that absolutely horrifying? Let me know your thoughts. Remember guys, there are wolves in sheep's clothing everywhere. And it's so important to protect yourselves against these predators. And sometimes the most terrifying thing about these predators is when you look in their histories, there have been so many red flags and warning signs. It's unbelievable that they're walking the streets at all. And in Damon Kalanka's case, that absolutely is how it played out. He should have been in prison for a very long time and never been able to kill Gabe. Let me know your thoughts, like I said in the comments. Join me again next time. And remember guys, be safe. Take care.